Today, I think I'm just going to try to collect my thoughts about a recurring concept that shows up in our amateur games. Um, and that is uh, not spending time in an optimal manner uh, during the course of a game. So one example of that would be if a player were to move very quickly in a complex position and not really fully understand what's going on. And then as a result of having moved quickly, they make more mistakes than they would have otherwise made. And so, so that that's just the general observation. Um, or theory. Um, so this is something that is a theory that I've, I don't know, and I have some support for, but also you'll find like ladies professional shogi player uh, Shogi Harbor, as well as Grandmaster Feingold have a number of points to share about how beginners think about the game. Um, and yeah, I guess it's not just beginners, it's any amateur players who, um, you know, have serious aspirations about the game. So if you're trying to improve, and if you're trying to ask other people, how do you improve, they probably would observe with the rest of us that one way to play better moves would be to carefully think during the game uh, while you still have an opportunity to change the result of the game. And in chess, we have quite a few positions where it feels pretty dire, where if you're down a rook, you're down a queen, you know, it's there are a number of positions even with less material loss, that it just feels so dire. And it can be easy to get emotional about such a situation and not... I mean, even if you were to fight out your hardest, there's a good chance down so much material you would just be completely dead in the water. Yeah, so welcome to the world of Shogi, where many many things are possible due to this drop rule uh, regenerating pieces on the board defensive and offensive opportunities uh, occur in great multitude in shogi um, so i welcome you to play shogi if you get burned out on chess but um, just bear in mind shogi is a really complex game so you might actually see a phenomenon where players, after playing a game for many minutes, sometimes even over an hour, sometimes even longer than multiple hours per game, but at an amateur level, I don't suspect we see that so much. But um, you'll just see sometimes... Uh, amateur players play very quickly, even quite late in the game. And one could ask, well, you know, nobody wants to lose. You've invested so much into playing a game in the first place. Why would you um, play such a hasty move so late in the game? So... That's kind of the effect that I'm thinking about here, trying to come to some grips over. Um, uh, so, yeah, oh, this website here is lishogi.org, L-I-S-H-O-G-I.org. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Yes, I'm still just reflecting on 
this time management concept for amateur players. Because in the chess world over the years, if you've seen my live streams or videos, I've chided amateur players quite a bit for not spending their time. And it's really easy to get hooked on one minute or two minute or three minute no increment games. And even if you're playing with an increment, it's easy to get hooked on, well, I'm just going to move and enjoy the game and have fun and let whatever happens happen. But then such players who have this cavalier style of play also... Um, yeah, what am I trying to say? Um, uh, what am I trying to say here? They will ask, well, how do I improve at the game? And so to them we recommend, well, why don't you spend a bit more time thinking about your moves before you make them and observe if there are any patterns you can find and try to work on improving those. Um, yeah. So, what can I do? So, also you see many players who say, like, they're hooked on playing speed chess, or they don't even admit that, necessarily, but they express frustration at being stuck at where they're stuck at, but then don't really care to put in the work to improve. I'll just say, oh, well, I guess I'm just always going to be a beginner. And, you know, that's, you know, maybe that's fine for them. Maybe that's, um, I don't know. It's super hard to improve at a game, to become really good at it. Um, hmm. Hmm. So, so what can I say? Oh, but yeah, with amateur chess players frequently you'll see that they have at least half of their clock time still on the clock by the time the game ends and so if you're doing that for fun just for online play i guess that's the level of commitment you're making to yourself and to the game um and that's not unusual um if you're traveling somewhere to play in a chess tournament or a shogi tournament, or other sort of event, you know, if you made the effort to, I don't know, part of it might be that just you want to go sightseeing. That's totally fine. Um, so, like, finishing games early, enjoying a nice meal, seeing some sights somewhere, maybe that's part of the plan. If it's a local event, you're probably not doing that so much. But the further you travel, maybe the less about the game and the more about the travel it, um, your experience is about. So yeah, I think it depends greatly like what you're doing in terms of can you improve. Um, but it's just weird to see players sometimes um, remarking on how they need help improving but then also just not being bothered to do things that would obviously help them improve. Um, so that's one perspective. Um, and now I'm trying to pivot from chess to shogi and think about this. So in chess, like every time pieces get exchanged, the game gets simpler until a point where people call the game won or lost or drawn with pretty great confidence. In Shogi, you'll find that every piece exchange tends to muddy the waters a bit. 
And so Shogi endgames are wildly chaotic and exciting and fun to watch, uh, but also can be immensely stressful. Um, so now I'm trying to think, well, what advice would I give an amateur as an amateur myself? Is it appropriate to move quickly even amidst chaos? Because you observe, like, when you're playing against stronger opponents, and when they're playing against stronger than them opponents, the time consumption isn't always uniform. Which is a bit, I don't know, surprising? Because um, there's a rule called Byoyomi, or time control, where you get an extra 60 seconds or such per move. Every single move. And a timekeeper will personally read your time to you. And give you gentle reminders when like half a minute's passed, when 40 seconds, and 50, 51, 52, all the way up to your final second have passed. They will gently remind you. And that's your time. You can spend it, or you can not spend it. Um, and I think that's really clever. Um, it takes the pressure off the player for having to manage time in addition to everything else they're managing during the game. Because the game gets more and more complex every time pieces exchange. And that means you probably need to spend more and more time thinking about every position until the game comes to a resolution. So what advice could I give to an amateur? Um, well, if you want to win, it benefits you to spend your time. Welcome. Um, but also, like, there's more to life than winning. And Sure, you can go absolutely gung-ho on a single game, spend all the time you have available to you, and even if you optimally allocate your time for an energy for an entire game, or even for an entire tournament, that can be kind of exhausting. Um, you might burn out on it. I don't know. Um... So it's hard for me to advise uh, amateur players that, you know, maybe even though you definitely want to try to win each game, um, yes, yeah, spending every last second you have for every game might help in a short term, but may or may not produce long-term results if you indeed do burn out. Um, so, what else can I think to say about time management? I don't know. I think it's different for shogi than it is for chess. I think in chess, I would strongly recommend that you know, okay, you might have some energy issues with games. <laughs> Am I? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I think with chess games, the game typically goes about 40 moves, 4-0, maybe a bit longer. Some games go much longer, some go much shorter. But you'll find that you know, there's not a ton of moves to a chess game, and moves tend to exchange pawns or pieces. So uh, chess can produce many complicated positions, but also the later you are in the game, the less, hopefully, you're going to need your time to figure it out if you've taken... If you made some effort to study endgames, hopefully you can play endgames with some level of confidence, or at least play with your rating peers at an endgame. Um, 
Otherwise, you have to figure out how you're going to split your time between opening, middle game, and end game if you're like extremely bad at end games for chess for some reason then you would probably need to figure out how to have extra time just in case you do end up going into an end game um but probably you can play um with your rating peers in the end game with about the same level of time cuz you know if you're rating peers either the only way that's not the case is if your openings and or middle games are fantastic, but your end game's awful. But it's hard to prepare every opening without having spent any time studying end games. So chances are you're probably okay at end games, but maybe you're not. But anyway, what I'm trying to say there is with chess, um, because you can have some uh, idea of how much time it's going to take you to play the end game. And how much energy, you know, you can focus on the opening and focus on the middle game while you're playing the game. And don't need to panic that, well, gosh, I need to save, like, all of my time to play the end game. So, in chess, I would strongly caution amateur players, if you want, if you have any aspirations, if you think you can be competent at this game at all, um, why not give it a shot? Try to spend some time during your game, and don't just blitz out the first move that comes to mind. Sure, it can be fun to do that sometimes, but if you're doing it all the time, why not just play pinball or something else instead? Um, so that's advice I would give with regard to chess. Um, however... Now I'm going to start to react to what I just watched on Shogi Harbor's channel. So, I agree that for improvement, you do need to spend the time that's available on your clock. If you're going to be competitive at Shogi, um, that you really need to be spending that. That's what it's there for. It's meant to be spent. Um, but also... Okay, yeah, here we have a beginner learning this opening. It's kind of exciting. Uh, the answer here is that if you moved the rook to the left, you're going to have a difficult time here. But um, anyway, yeah, here comes the fork. Um, so in Shogi, even if you end up getting some sort of an opening advantage, uh, it can still be difficult. Games can run for many, many, many moves, much longer than a school class. And if you're playing more than one game, you might get exhausted. You might uh, be at some risk of burnout in a way that I don't think happens in chess the same way it happens in Shogi. Um, I think Shogi... I've used this metaphor that uh, if chess is a battle, shogi is a war. So, it takes many moves for pieces to move from one side of the board to the other. And sometimes the king will even make an escape to the opponent's side of the board where it's safer. Um, so, it's complicated. Uh... So if I'm trying to give advice about time management to amateurs in Shogi, it's a bit tricky because like you see games like this too, right? Where they made an opening mistake and it's going to continue to snowball the rest of the game. And how can they be fully invested in this game yet knowing that like, hey, I'm down this much or I have a difficult position and every time it gets more difficult, there's more and more to look at every turn. Um, like, so how do you do that? Uh, I don't know. So, 
So what? So yeah, if you're trying to improve and become extremely competitive, you will. It benefits you from a competitive perspective to spend your time. But also, you're aware that you're going to have some difficult games, and a person's attention span is limited. Um, I mean, there's this kind of meme in chess about the three-fold repetition rule and how if you're playing in a tournament, sometimes a chess player will repeat a position once. And you ask, well, why would a chess player repeat a position? And then like go back to where the older position was why would they do this repetition on purpose it doesn't help them in terms of a computer evaluation of the game and i think the answer there is twofold um part of it is to get some time to think because chess is not so generous with thinking time as shogi is um well even in cases where it is uh you get time added to the clock typically instead of a delay clock there are multiple forms of delay clocks for chess um but in many tournaments you will get just time added to the clock per move so the more times you repeat positions the more time you have to think um even if you're moving very quickly. So that's one motivation in chess to repeat a position, but the other motivation is to exhaust the opponent until they make a mistake. So that happens. Um, so yeah, there's two reasons to repeat positions with chess. And the reason the opponent will make a mistake is because the longer you're stuck playing a position, the if every move is like a roll of a die or a flip of a coin or something to that effect, just the more moves there are, the more opportunities for a mistake creep in. Um, but also, like there is some mental tax on having to make decision after decision after decision. And so, let me think. Um, um, so I'm now trying to switch back to Shogi here. Think about how a Shogi game is so, so much longer than a chess game. And yet, yeah, not all games are of the same level of importance, and that's true of chess as well. Like, you have some games where you go travel to play in a tournament. Maybe the tournament's the main focus of your play. Or maybe it's just um, some side adventure that you choose to do for fun. Um, but, yeah, perhaps that's... Um, Sorry, I split my attention there because I noticed that one player's clock was ticking and yet it's the opponent's move that confused me a bit. Something doesn't seem entirely right here. Let me refresh. All right, that didn't do anything. But anyway, so uh, you might have your travel being the primary focus as opposed to I went to travel to play in a money event and I went hundreds or thousands of miles to play in it, and I wanted to do my best and completely focus on the event while I was there, and then have some extra travel time on either end of the event to um, just enjoy the sights and such. Um, so they're two different mindsets. Uh, as long as you understand what your mindset is, I think you can be happy with the outcome either way. Um, but yeah, if your goal is to do really well in a chess tournament or other event, then focusing on that event will help. Um, 
So, yeah, if you're trying to play your best, trying to win at all costs, then spend your time. Think about your moves. Whereas if you're just enjoying online blitz, that's kind of a different affair. Then do what you want. Just try to have fun. If it stops being fun, if you keep losing, well, if you want to improve, spend more time thinking. That helps quite a lot. Um, and then if you really want to improve, um, get a coach or join a chess club or join a group of players who are improving. There's so many ways to do it. Read a book, watch a video, do anything. And while you're doing whatever you're doing, find out, is this helping you or is this not helping you? So anyway, that's for chess what you would do. And so I mentioned all that as a side, but when you're thinking about Shogi, and time management, there does, I think, get to be a fatigue curve that players, I don't know, perhaps youthful players don't observe this, but I think everyone else would to some extent. And maybe if I'd learned Shogi a lot younger, maybe I would have a different opinion about this. But it seems like many players will hit some point where, okay, we've played 100 moves, 200 moves, 500 moves, and I'm just going to start making moves a bit faster to conserve energy, to throw off my opponent's rhythm, or for whatever other reason, and there are decent reasons. But then you go and share the game with your friends afterward, and ask, well, why did I lose the game? Well, you lost the game because you moved too quickly. Well, okay, you're right. Yes, that was definitely a factor. Um, and sometimes comedically so. Like, you'll see a player who has 60 seconds per move. will spend maybe two, maybe five, maybe ten seconds thinking and just play a move at somewhere around move 50 or move 100. This can happen. And then they ask, how can I get better? And spend your time. I don't know. Like, yes, that's obviously a factor. It's an important factor, even. One that, in many cases in chess, I have chided many amateur players about just advising like hey if you want to improve this is the way to do it and yeah it will help with shogi too if you spend your time um, thinking about all your moves don't blitz something out um so uh what can I say? Um, <sighs> so, yeah, that is certainly going to help. Um, but also, I'm somewhat understanding if players find that this is just very difficult to do. So I'm not saying this to be contrarian or anything like that. But, yeah, I, obviously if you want to maximize your winning chances on any individual game, you will need to spend your time even if you know exactly what your current move is going to be, say you have only one reasonable capture, say you have only one reasonable way to escape check, or something like that, even if you're absolutely certain about that move, you can start thinking about the next move while your time ticks for the current move. It might be very difficult and exhausting to think ahead like that 
it probably is. Um, and the further you think ahead, the more chance that what you're looking at isn't even real. And you might be burning a ton of energy thinking about something that just might not be in any way reasonable. Um, that could happen. Is there any solution to it? Um, well, ironically, one solution would be, you know, even though it's in your best interest for a single game, at least we think it is, to spend all your time thinking on a move, sometimes, you know, blitzing a move might be good for your mental health in some way. Um, granted, at that point, you're sacrificing possibly the game for your sanity. Uh, saying that, you know, I'm doing my best, I'm trying hard to think about this game and these positions. However, um, just not being aware of um, I don't know. You know, if it's just too much to think about the game, if you're not able to see what's going to happen next, and you find that exhausting and tiring, that, hey, I spent the last five moves thinking about things which are never going to happen. And just for your own sanity, wanting to get a move on the board so you don't have to be, I don't know, so you're not constantly getting this wave of negative feedback of missing idea after missing idea after missing idea, and you want some predictability to return. Um, I guess blitzing a move can have some advantages, even though we know it's extremely disadvantageous from a perspective of um, you're just giving away a resource. Do you have a reason to give away the resource? Well, actually, yes. The reason would be that you keep finding move after move that you're not looking at the right ideas and the right resources. And you're just needing to try something different for the sake of a mental reset. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but this is just how I'm kind of thinking about it. That, like, if you keep spending your time and the things that you're finding are just exhausting, I can appreciate that you want to try to do something different. Now, there might be something better you could do other than moving instantly, but I kind of respect the instant move response that happens just when a player is just feeling beaten down a bit. I kind of get it. Again, this is just me thinking off the top of my head here, but... Um, and certainly this is not good advice for how to win a tournament or anything like that. But yeah, it can be sometimes exasperating to note like hey i've looked at a lot of positions this game and i've missed so many key ideas and i just don't trust myself to keep coming up with key ideas anymore here um so i can kind of respect the instant blitz move in that pers in that way but a healthier thing to do, rather than blitzing the move, would just be, you know, meditate on the position, if you can. You can say, okay, you know what, I've decided my move, but I'm going to sit here for 30 seconds and just not do anything whatsoever. Not think about the position, not think about my moves, not think about their moves. I'm just going to sit here doing absolutely nothing for the duration that I could be thinking about things, but I'm too discouraged right now. And, 
you know, that meditation might help. Maybe. Maybe you'll think of something not related to the game. Now, that might also be a bad thing, though. You might think of some other thing that's distracting that you don't want to think about. And so, again, yeah, I respect the just blitz a move, not wanting to think, going berserk kind of mode. I kind of respect that, but perhaps meditation has some advantage in that, like, somehow you'll think of something positive or some kind of inspiration might come while you're trying to clear your mind. If you've not done meditation before, that might be difficult. And yeah, I'm not really an expert at that sort of thing, but it's just food for thought, something to consider. But yeah, otherwise I kind of respect the sometimes you just blitz it now since you're so, I don't know, wanting to move on to the next game or wanting to move on to something else. But if you're wanting to improve and enjoy the game deeper, then blitzing moves is not going to help. Um, it might help in the short term, just letting you get to play a lot of games. But in the long term, that's moving quickly before you've had used your thinking time. It's not going to help you improve in the short term, but also you won't have as much to reflect on after the game of what positions did I... Like, after the game, you can review with your opponent sometimes, here's what I was thinking about. What were you thinking about? And you can have this conversation with them. And they'll explain to you, well, those are some interesting thoughts, but here's what I was thinking about. And then you respond, well, here's what I was thinking about. And these post-game analyses can be quite fun. But it's kind of hard to have a post-game analysis if during the game you didn't consider very much. Um... So there's another point here. It's possible to deeply consider positions, but have tremendous confidence sometimes. Sometimes is the key word there. So if there's something that's very familiar, or if you're just really sure you solved some position, you really understand it deeply, spending extra time thinking about the position isn't necessarily going to yield fruit every time. So spending all of your time just for the sake of doing it isn't... I don't know, I could advocate that, but um, spending your time because... Um, let me think. Um... So spending your time in order to find better moves because you don't understand a position can be useful. Um, but yeah, if there are positions where there's some obvious tactic and you know here's the tactic, here's the follow-up, here's the follow-up after the follow-up. I know I'm winning a lot of material, I know my king is safe, I know their king is not safe, and I'm super confident about this position. Um, even then, it can still be helpful to just double-check the line, to make sure that there's no surprises there. But if you go around paranoid everywhere that something terrible is going to happen, then it becomes difficult. Um, so, I guess, um, so yeah, having paranoia is not necessarily constructive either. Um, it's good to have a healthy skepticism 
not an unhealthy paranoia, and not an unhealthy overconfidence. So virtues like the thing between it's the state of character concerned with choice lying in a mean. It's having a healthy skepticism about things. So uh, paranoia would be on the one extreme and overconfidence would be on the other. And there can be positions where, you know, thinking too much is just, I don't know, an insult to yourself. And there can be positions where um, not thinking enough is also not the right thing. So what do we do? How do you figure out the right amount of time to spend on a move? Well, it's up to you. But if you're finding in post-game analysis, and you should do post-game analysis with your opponent, it's fun. You'll learn a lot together, the same way you would with chess, but nobody does it in chess. But people should. But in Shogi, they're eager to do this. Um, but if you're finding during post-game analysis that you just really don't know what to talk about, um, then that might indicate that during the game you move too quickly. So that would be some kind of... And you can have reasons you did that, and you can even talk about those reasons with your opponent. Like, hey, I had some other thing distracting me, or whatever reason that you moved quickly and couldn't think of things to do here. You can share that with the opponent and hear their thoughts, and they can share their experiences with you. You can share your experiences with them. But if you're wanting to have a post-game discussion, it helps to have some material to discuss. So uh, if you've already got a ton of material to discuss and you don't really feel like resigning the game, I could kind of understand continuing to play on, but if you're just exhausted or whatever, it's... I don't know. I think in Shogi, somehow to me, it feels more forgivable to move instantly than it might be in chess. In chess, like, there's no back button, and there's no back button in Shogi. I mean, sure, we're seeing games with take backs here, but if you're playing pretty serious games, you're not doing take backs. Um, and where was I going with this? So, yeah, in chess, in more serious games, things that are worth discussion and worth reviewing, um, you'll do best if you spend your time before the critical position or at the critical position. Because once the moment's passed, often in chess, there's no recovery. In Shogi, it's quite exciting because there are a lot of opportunities for recovery. Like here we see a handicap game being played. You can imagine similarly a game where one player had just lost a ton of pieces. Can they still win the game? Well, yes, it's still winnable. Are they likely to win? Not really. Is it... So... <laughs> Transport's asking what happened to Mahjong. We'll get there, we'll get there. But I'm just sharing my musings on um, time management in chess and in shogi. And trying to explain just thoughts I've had over the years. And here, I respect it that, you know, the handicap giver has a full hour on the clock with an extra minute every move and um, they're not spending all of it. They're moving very quickly. So in chess, I would consider it, you know, if you got a position like this in chess where you're down 10 pieces, chances are you didn't spend your time earlier in the game when it mattered. And I wouldn't, while a player could play this out to the end, I wouldn't fault them for blitzing the whole thing once it's dead lost. In Shogi, you can spend a ton of time and energy on every single move, and you could find that exhausting. And 
Um, so as an alternative to that, um, you'll see players either in an advantageous or equal or worse position. You'll see them blitz out moves because the outcome is so uncertain and they just can't think about it anymore. But they might get invested in the game later on if there's something they get excited about. I kind of respect that. So I think for chess, like what I would consider weird time management, I think for Shogi, sometimes could be okay. If you're trying to play some super competitive game with huge prizes at stake, then it's not quite so okay. If you're playing um, with very strong players, if you're playing um, with people who take the game quite seriously and have built up quite the culture behind the game, then, yeah, you want to try to observe their culture and spend your time and respect yourself and respect them. Um, so, yeah, there's that whole element to all of this, too. Um, that's like, yeah, if you blitz your moves, this says something about you but also says something about what you think about the game and maybe even what you think about your opponent. So you have to be mindful of it. Um, but yeah, it's tricky. Alternatively, if you find like playing serious games of Shogi with serious opponents exhausting... There are ways to play the game where you and your opponent agree that, hey, we're going to play with the clock, and this is how the clock is set, and we both agree that this is the way the clock should be set for purposes of this game, and it's going to be different than serious shogi. And that's a different circumstance than um, most sites offer. Like, if you're playing on Shogi Club 24, if you're playing on 81 Dojo, or even in many cases on other sites where we have either an increment or a Byoyomi, um, you know, the cultural thing, the respectful thing to do is spend the time, try to play your best, you know, respect yourself and your opponent, and if they're interested, be willing to do uh, some post-game analysis with them. So, yeah, there's some element of respect to this. It's not just about what you think. It's not just about the game. It's about respecting what other people think, too. So. Um, what can I think to add or something more to this? I don't know. Maybe with more experience I'll have more stories and other things to offer, but just at present that's kind of my thoughts and my reaction to um, just comments I've seen or heard from uh, really, I don't know, from professional shogi, professional chess players it's just kind of my reaction to what I'm hearing and seeing. So, um, yeah, who knows? Maybe in the future I'll have more to offer. Yeah, I mean, that's not a terrible idea either. So, yeah, that's kind of the other thing I was thinking about here, is that if I said anything interesting, maybe it's worth sharing. I don't know what channel it would even go on, but it might be worth sharing there as well. And who knows, maybe I'll do reflections like this more frequently and have other musings to muse about. Um, and that hopefully I have some insights to share. I've not quite reached 2000 just yet, 
in the chess rating systems. But I'm not overly concerned about it either, and that's fine. I guess I could muse a little bit about chess ratings. You know, we've got time to think about this too. So, I've traveled quite a few places, played quite a few chess games. Um, what can I reflect and share about this? Um, while trying to make it not just all about me. Well, um, hmm. So, yeah, I guess everybody who plays competitive chess has some winning aspirations. It's more fun to win than to lose. Um, but also, winning every game uh, takes a tremendous amount of energy and effort, unless you have to be some kind of prodigy. And it's difficult to find players who are openly honest, I guess, about... Like, hey, I had to practice six hours today, and six hours the day before that, and six before that. And, like, it's rare to find players who um, achieve great things, but then also openly admit, I've done crazy amounts of reading and practice and study and coaching and things like this. It's easier to see folks that say oh yeah no i won that game because i spotted the right ideas and not necessarily at that same moment have that same individual thinking about well gosh you know it really paid off that i studied rook end games four years ago um you know the individuals have a strong self-preservation instinct and it can be um, challenging, I guess. Um, I'm trying to think of what to say to for somebody with such a strong self-preservation instinct to readily admit just how fragile they are and how they needed so much help to get every step to where they're at today. Um, it's, I don't know, holding everything in your mind all at once while also trying to play your best game seems quite challenging. Although maybe you've had some coaching about how to handle interviews, or maybe you've seen how interviews are handled by people you look up to as role models. But, yeah, if you're, um, if you've achieved a lot in any given field... It's wonderful to think, gosh, you had such a role in your own achievement. And there's a good chance you played a big role in it. But luck can sometimes help, too. I mean, luck seems almost always necessary, but it can take skill, too, uh, to actually um, succeed at the things that uh, you had chances to succeed at. So you get quite excited about the skill element and perhaps forget in the moment that it took quite a bit of luck as well to get to where you're at. Um, so I guess uh, initially I thought I was going to talk about ratings. Um, maybe I should still talk about that. Because there's online ratings, there's in real life tournament ratings that are both national. I mean, you might even have some local tournaments that have a different rating system. Um, there's international rating of tournaments. And each organization and each group has its own rules about how they rate players. And online players take this rating number quite seriously. 
It determines the strength of the opponents that you get paired against. So many sites do offer rating systems and allow players for free to earn ratings. Uh, some sites will require you to pay to uh, participate on the site and have the right to earn a rating. But many sites will just see, well, this helps us figure out who to play against who, and the more user engagement we have on the site, the better our numbers are, so we're just going to allow everyone to get a rating. Um, but yeah, players use this rating online or elsewhere, even offline, like if you're playing in a U.S. chess event or an international chess event, you use this as some kind of a bragging point of, hey, look, this is what I've achieved. Um, because we don't have so many, uh, I would say, professional chess titles, but we just don't have so many chess titles. In the shogi world, amateurs can earn ranks. In the chess world, Getting a title is about the first thing that your peers might recognize you for. Um, because, I mean, you can say, well, I'm in rating category B, and that means my rating is between 1700 and 1800. But your peers are not going to know what rating category B means because it's not a title. So it's a bit different in chess and in shogi that, yeah, categories exist. You can go to tournaments. Some tournaments have rules that we only let players participate by category. And we'll even go a step further and say that if your rating is below this category, we're not even going to let you into, we're not going to let you play up a category. We're, you're going to have to play it just among your rating peers. So some tournaments, um, frequently U.S. chess tournaments will have rating caps per section, but there also are some category tournaments where they'll just split players to say, okay, title players play in this division, A category, B category, C category are all separate divisions and they don't allow you to play up. So if you're in the C category, you don't get to play the B players. You're stuck playing with the C players, unlike most tournaments, which are rating capped instead. So anyway, that's kind of where things are at there. Um, I think players would, I don't know. One thing that's kind of missing in chess is the notion of measuring your progress as a player measuring your learning. Yes, we can measure your outcomes. We can measure your performance and see, hey, based on you winning so many games against so many opponents, you know, we think this is your level of performance. This is who, um, so we give you a rating number and that factors into how you play future tournaments. But we don't really have one standard way of measuring learning. There are dozens and dozens and dozens of different ways to do it, but there's not one standard way to do it. You can think of the XKCD comic, which mentions, um, you know, if there are 14 competing standard ways to do a thing, Let's introduce one that meets everybody's needs. Oh, hey, look, now we've got 15 competing standards. You know, that could... Maybe that's a problem um, with trying to measure chess learning in a, some objective way. Maybe there is no perfect objective way to measure learning. Uh, it's not just a chess problem, but... Um, hmm. Yeah, what does one say next? I got a bit excited about this game in front of me here. Um, but... So, a player can earn a rating. The player has many different books and softwares and magazines and other tools that help them measure their performance in various ways with like try to guess the grandmaster's move or try to guess the master's move 
or the amateurs move or whatever or you have books that are all just checkmate puzzles and just solve all the puzzles here this is a checkmate in three moves this one's a checkmate in seven moves so there's a lot of ways to gauge your learning um another way to gauge your learning is how many books have you read this year there's a lot of ways to do it but um, in terms of one standard way to measure performance, um, I think there's not a perfect way yet. I think Lee Chess's way of measuring performance um, with the Insight system is pretty exciting. I really hope that it proves useful to many players and that it can continue to be improved. But it seems to be at the forefront of our technology today for measuring learning and performance. Uh, even though it's not some sort of universal objective thing, it seems like a really nice tool. But yeah, there's just so many different ways to measure learning and performance. Um, but players tend to only think about rating. So that's what we all fixate on. Um, so, yeah, I still wish that chess had something more akin to what Shogi offers, with classes being a popular thing. I don't see how the rating system could be improved for that purpose, but I don't know, like, I don't think you have to change the rating system. I think it just has to uh, classes need to function a bit more like your standard RPG. Or for those of us in the West who might not have played an RPG, just think about Pokemon. You go around collecting the badges, and that indicates your level of strength. Well, with chess, yeah, you can gain a rating, the rating puts you in a rating class and all that. But if you look at the rules for how masters get their titles, um, you'll find that it with exception of the U.S. Chess Federation, the international titles um, just they aren't strictly rating based. Uh, yes, you do need a great performance, but there are a whole bunch of other restrictions that factor into your performance. And yes, the U.S. Chess rating system has things such as Life Master and other like. There are ways to indicate you've had this level of performance over so many games, so we're going to recognize that in a different way. Um, but no, I think I think the way Shogi does it is quite interesting. Um, and maybe I don't understand it perfectly, but if I understand right, each dojo has its own concept of a rating for players. And whoever operates the dojo, the licensed dojo pro or amateur, must be pros, right? The licensed person who has a document that credits them as being so strong at this game that allows them to operate a dojo in the first place, that person gets to choose the rules for your first don here based on all these qualifications. Um, and I think if chess were to go in a similar direction, if each little organization had a way of measuring performance and giving away titles, so you could be, yeah, I'm going to be level one, I first, well, yeah, I like the Q Don system. Um, so, yeah, you could be a one Don in one dojo, you could be a two Q in a different dojo, and two Don in a different dojo still. Yeah. So, I think it makes sense for each chess club to do something kind of similar to the Shogi world, where whoever operates um the organization can choose whether or not to award certain ranks and every organization can award its ranks a little bit differently if they so choose and 
I think that's an entirely sensible and communal way to go about, like, determining ranks. So I think that's one option that seems quite reasonable for, I don't know, making players uh, not entirely obsessed over rating as the holy grail of things. But that's just the shogi way of doing things. You also find... Um, yeah, my chess rating is just under 2,000. So I'm not an expert. If I put in a ton of effort, I could probably make expert, maybe even U.S. National Master if I put in a lot more effort. But um, it's not where I stand today. Yeah, it's still like super high percentile. And I'm content with that for now. Uh, it's improving my rating is not my top priority at the moment but yeah i think it'd be cool if chess clubs could assign ranks to players i think that'd be nice uh separately if that maybe that's not the right way to go maybe a different still reasonable approach would be um to have something more like StarCraft has, where um, you just have a some... I mean, ostensibly there's an MMR rating behind the scenes, but there could also be other thresholds involved in a rank-up, rank-down situation. And um, so you could still have rating as well as other things, other ranks that are not strictly tied to rating. And there's a lot of ways you could determine if a person's eligible for a given rank or not. You could, I don't know, have them solve puzzles, have them play against a bot, have them do this, that, and the other. You can make up your own rules for what you think makes a person qualified to have a certain rank. Um, so, um, what can I say? Yeah, so I think this obsession that players have with ratings as the only measure of performance is quite limiting but until we come up with something better it's i don't know players are still quite satisfied with it but it just doesn't lend itself to learning very easily um so i don't know that i have more points to draw about ratings and rankings at this time um it is true that with Lee Chess, I did help apply some tweaks to the rating formula and even to the leaderboard system. So leaderboard related changes made it slightly harder to get on the leaderboard uh, so that there wouldn't be so many false accusations of cheating. Um, so... You know, if it takes more effort to get on the leaderboard in the first place, there's going to be more games played. And if there's more games played, there's more opportunities to catch someone who might have been cheating. So, consequently, uh, if there are accusations by the time somebody actually gets on the leaderboard, there either is basically no evidence or there's an abundance of evidence to support a cheating claim at that point. So that's one thing I helped with. But another, um, I provide feedback about tweaking some rating deviation factor that, um, uh, what can I say? Uh, it, uh, there's some convergence of ratings based on um, if a player's played a ton of games, then their rating doesn't vary as much game to game. 
than somebody who just joined the website. So there was some tweaking of constants that improved the predictive accuracy of ratings specifically for Lee Chess. And that was cool to do. Uh, but yeah, I guess I don't have some broader point there. So again, these are just my musings about various topics with time management, ratings, and ranks. And yeah, who knows? I might have other topics to muse about in the future. I guess that's the thought. Um, I've had musings on how players can learn from their games and learn what things to study, but I don't know that until I have some title to go along with my own musings, I don't know that my opinions matter any more than those of the people listening. So it's not to say I'm out there to chase a title right now, but you know it'll be easier to get a message expressed if I had a title to go with it. Um, do I think it's better to rank someone who plays the same person often or to uh, someone who plays different opponents each time? Um, hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so... Yeah, I guess there's probably things to be said both ways there. Um, I think you'll find... I've heard things written about the U.S. chess rating system. How, for example, you might have some inmate who has the same opponents every time they play. And whether that's um, just them excluding a certain potential opponent or just not being able to get access to other opponents um it just means they're the strongest where they're at and the fact that they can just continue submitting game after game after game and continue getting very similar results um doesn't necessarily support them having earned a title or earned a rating or something of that sort but maybe it does in some merit-based way. Like, if they're an inmate, they don't really have a lot of options. Um, so they are going to play the same opponents again and again. And uh, if they just happen to win every game, then, yeah, their rating will improve, and maybe even they'll be eligible, uh, as I think has happened in the U.S. Chess Federation before, where... Um, you know, they qualified for some championship, whether or not they could travel to it. Um, I hope they were still able to participate. I forget the exact specifics of the situation. But um, so there's that situation. But yeah, the ranks and ratings would be more, um, I don't know, representative of the general uh, collective of all players the more opponents you play against. So I don't have strong uh, strong feelings about ratings, um, but I think in terms of titling and ranking players, you'll find that both, well, not the U.S. Chess Federation, but you'll find that the International Chess Federation, FIDA, does uh, require that you have to play against opponents from several nationalities or representing several countries in order to be able to um, receive a title that you've earned. So, yeah, there's all these restrictions that are required, these uh, conditions that have to be met for a player to get a title, and they could just barely miss out on the title if... Um, they aren't able to get their norms for the title based on all these restrictions. And I think the restrictions make sense. I don't think you want one country to have lighter standards than the rest. So in order to ensure that all titles are earned equitably, there do need to be a standard set of rules in place for ranks and titles. But as for the numbers that you would use for ratings, 
since those can fluctuate a lot from month to month and year to year, again, depending on age or other circumstances. I don't know their strong opinions about ratings, but yeah, in terms of is it better to have titles and ranks decided by playing against multiple opponents, I would think so. In the same way that like you find Pokemon trainers, and some will say that I've got the best Pokemon to go beat my one or two opponents that I always play against. Um, at least you'll find in-game characters, personalities that'll say similar sorts of things. And they say this as if to point out that, well, that's actually a weakness, and, oh, you won the battle, and now I've learned my lesson, and I'm going to go play against lots of different opponents. That said, even though what I'm proposing makes sense for ranks and titles, can you learn a lot by playing against the same opponent? Sure. There's a national master, uh, John Chernoff from California, who's frequently offered simultaneous exhibitions on Lee Chess, and I've participated in those. And we've played the same opening in almost all of our encounters, and it's gone super deep theoretically. And um, we've spent quite a bit of time outside these exhibitions also researching the same opening. And he still wins like every game somehow, and it's kind of maddening given how much effort we've put into trying to figure it out. Um, but you can still learn a lot by playing the same opponent. Uh, I mean, he's been a national master. Um, so has he improved? Uh, it's kind of hard to improve once you've already hit the top, basically. Um, have I improved? Well, um, a little bit, incidentally. Um... Well, I mean, when you're in, like, the top 10 percentile or something, how much higher do you want to improve? But, yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying, like, yeah. <laughs> Not sure what you want me to say, but I recognize that there are two audience members participating in this conversation. Um, I mean, yeah, I really don't know what you want me to say about that. Um, anyway, since it's my remarks, um, I guess I'll say, yeah, no, I do think John is pretty much hit the top of where almost any U.S. chess player can go. With extraordinary effort, sure, you could get very slightly farther, but um, at some point you have to recognize, well, I'm in this community, I'm doing the best I can with this community, but it's not my full-time gig. Um, and just, again, speaking about chess... So, um, where do I go? Oh, yeah, have I improved? Yeah, incidentally a little bit, but I've mostly been focusing on other things, so I've not improved a ton at chess now. Um, yes, yeah, so that's kind of where I'm at. Um, I do think it'd be cool if uh, groups were able to assign their own ranks and titles and things. I think we'd see a lot more people inspired to join local clubs as opposed to a national federation in cases like that. Um, and then that way you'd see more growth of lots of local clubs instead of just players searching for a tournament list and where can I go play and 
Hey, look, it's the same organizer who runs every other tournament. They're running another one. And looking up and seeing, well, they have this kind of reputation, whether it's good, bad, neutral, whatever. Um, yeah, having chess be more about tournaments right now than it is about clubs is not necessarily healthy for the growth of the sport as a whole but it might be healthy for the national organization. I don't know. Again, just random musings on the thing. Yeah, so... Not sure what else we can amuse about in the future. I'll try to keep it mindful and useful, but... Who knows? Um, yeah, in general, I've just been writing more on my blog. I guess I'll continue writing there but it's sometimes easier to just talk about things than to write about them. So hopefully that's been fun. And we'll see when next we do something like this. I don't know if I think about it, but hopefully it leads to constructive conversation in the future. Or if not that, at least some kind of meditation on what things are. So yeah, hope we enjoyed this.